We are recording. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the last concurrent session. Um, I am Suzanne Snyder. I'm the mental health program manager with in the student intervention services at the South Carolina Department of Education. And I am here to introduce Ms. Jennifer Butler. She's the program director for the South Carolina Department of Mental Health's Office of Suicide Prevention. She also serves as the state lead for the South Carolina team in the VA, in the VA SAMHSA Governor's Challenge to prevent suicide among service members, veterans, and their families, and a team member of the SAMHSA Crisis Intercept Matt Pickens County team. She's been in practice for 26 years, with the last 23 23 years specializing in suicide prevention. She is the president of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the South Carolina chapter. In addition to being an AFSP advocacy field ambassador and serving on the AFSP National Public Policy Council. She's also a social work adjunct professor at three South Carolina universities. And she's here to um, present healing emotional fires as a family. So welcome Jennifer. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you everyone for attending. I am going to be asking you to interact with me. So please use the chat box um, when we go through this. If you feel um, you have a question or if there, we're going to talk about some data and some intervention or discussion questions so you can unmute yourself. So thank you. Thank you for joining this. We teach our children how to respond when there's a fire in the home, right? Or there's a fire at school. We do fire drills. We show them, okay, this is the route out, or this is what you do. You stop, drop, and roll down low to the floor, or call 911. This, when we get outside the home, this is our location point we're going to meet at. We go through all of these steps to prepare our kids if there's a fire in the home. But we don't do the same thing when there's an emotional fire in our home. So today we're going to be working on or talking about how do you support your child or child. I know this is might be a difficult subject for some of us because you may be lost survivors or child for a child. If this is a difficult subject, please take care of yourself during this time. You self just engage with us because discussions about suicide prevention could not be any more important than right now. So let's get started. So as I mentioned, we do a lot to talk about fires, physical fires. We prefer them. We want them to understand the dangers of what can happen when a fire gets out of control. We also talk about no, no person left behind, right? Check on your neighbor, check on your sibling or your parent, make sure they're out. We have to do the same thing with emotional fires and with suicide prevention. We have to say no family member left behind. If one of us is struggling, if one of us is in an emotional crisis and it feels like our mind and our body and the world are on fire and it seems uncontrollable. Here are the people we're going to call. Here's what we're going to do. Here's how we talk about it. You post these crisis line numbers. You say no family member left behind, no classmate left behind. We take care of each other in dark times. So at the end of today's session, I hope you'll be able to distinguish between myths and realities about suicide identifying thoughts about addressing suicide prevention, increasing your awareness of at-risk comments and warning signs that may be exhibited by you, know more about the available resources and help in South Carolina, and also work as a collective group to cultivate hope. So let's talk about myths and realities. All right, here's where you engage. So here's our first group question, true or false? If you'll type in either T or F into the chat or true or false, either way, suicides usually happen without warning. What do you think? All right, I'm getting lots of false 
Very good. Yeah, thank you all for jumping in to respond. Got a couple of truths and I'm gonna to touch on that too. Yeah, so the answer is false. So it's a community, they're distracted we'll about the percentage that to have an suicide attempt. Okay, did their level of distress or level of plan to at least one person. Some have a I live in archives and I the day before he even died, him standing and being quiet and reserved. But I, I remember the thing that he was that different for him because he was a person anyway. Oh, Katrina, I'm sorry. I hope you can hear me mostly. I'm gonna, I see you said the service is going in and out. Um, what maybe I'll turn my camera off and see if that helps with the bandwidth. All right. So as I was saying, sometimes it, it may be that you have a piece of the puzzle and someone else has a, another piece of the puzzle. All right, let's try the next question. Talking about suicide makes people more likely to kill themselves. True or true? Or, you'll put that in the chat box. Great. Yeah, so there are no negative effects of asking someone about suicide. Talking about suicide actually gives somebody an opportunity to express their thoughts and feelings about something that they might have been keeping secret. And discussion brings it out into the open and allows for the opportunity for an intervention. Research shows that if someone is suicidal and you is their level of stress, it gives them some relief. If someone is not, not suicidal, you are not going to make them suicidal simply by asking the question. So let's try the next one. People who attempt suicide are at the low of suicide and may be at a higher risk of attempt after that. I know that's a complicated question. So true or false, are they more at risk for in the six months after an attempt or within that six months directly after the attempt? Thank you. It just says L. Scott. I, I don't know if that's M. Scott or, or Ms. Scott or Mr. Scott. All right, so false. People are at the greatest risk for suicide after an attempt and release from the hospital. Thank you, Lashandra. They are again at a greater risk several months after. The reason this is an important myth to talk about is after the hospital, they're okay now. Actually, those weeks right after the hospitalization Are the most critical and vulnerable time in the All of their problems were resolved. They and now they have perhaps have a little bit more energy because they've been giving medication to help with not having. Or not to be on guard even directly after receiving care. All right. True. True or false, suicide is preventable. This is our last question. I hope we all get this one right. Yay, yes, true. The vast majority of people who are suicidal do not want to die. They are in pain and they want to stop the pain. They've often lost hope. And providing a sense of hope that they can get help with their pain can and does save a life. We also know that the majority of those who have attempted suicide and survived do not go on to die by suicide. 
side later in life. So it is preventable when we all come together as a kid. I want you to know. If you are a law survivor, it doesn't mean that would protect that life. It just means, as we were saying earlier, we don't always have all the pieces to the puzzle. Or it could be an impulsive act that there wasn't time to respond. But in large part, suicide is preventable. So this is also another opportunity for you to type in the chat box. What kind of emotions or thoughts come up for you when you think about addressing suicide for a child, or even if this is not a child of yours, um, it's someone in your classroom? What thoughts or feelings come up for you? Is it fear? Is it anger? Is it concern? You can unmute or you can type it in your in the chat box. Yeah. See some anxiety, some fear. Those are really understandable, right? Because we care about them. We want to make sure that we do this in the right See, somebody wrote sadness. Of course, if someone that is young is suffering to that level that they thought of dying by suicide, that is heartbreaking to think about. And Carla writes thoughts of, of the failure, or Tara says unsure. Yeah. It's all this sort of mystery of, are we going to do the right thing? Are we going to say it in the right way? Are we going to know how to link them to the right resource? I promise you, no matter how you ask, if let's say that you asked a child and said, oh my gosh, are you suicidal? That may make you think that I'm afraid and that I may not be able to handle the answer. Oh, that is. Sorry if that sounded like I was scared, but okay. And your life means something to me. Yeah, Cassie says, sometimes on the flip side, you feel happy that you're able to reach out to them. Absolutely. If you walk away with anything today as educators, I hope that you walk away now knowing that there are lots of ways that you can intervene, even if it's just no, something that you need they, someone to reach out to. There are lots of ways to yes. resources. All right, so now we're going to, so I want you to just take just about five seconds, five, five, ten seconds and look at these stats and then I want you to tell me which one hold breath or which ones surprised you or that you feel a reaction to you. And you can either type in the box like the green box or the orange box or you can unmute. These are national stats but I am going to show show you some South Carolina related stats. So the number of suicide attempts by 2012. One of the things that's not on here that I do want to share with you as a stat is that we're talking about suicide attempts and suicide deaths. But it's also important to talk about chronic suicidal ideation. In America, there are approximately 12 million adults who live daily with suicidal thoughts. And there are another 3 million children who are living, children and adolescents who are living with suicidal thoughts on a daily basis. That's all to handle to think about that many young people million Americans every day. Most people don't know these stats. That is the second leading cause of death for those 12 to 18, and that is true in our state as well. Or that more teenagers and young adults are dying from suicide than cancer and heart disease and all those other illnesses that you see there combined. It is so important that we talk about this with them, that we prepare them for how to manage their emotions. So let's talk about the younger ones. 
While suicide in elementary school age children is rare, the number of six to 12 year olds who visit the children's hospital for suicidal thoughts or self-harm has more than 19. The sooner we can start having conversations with kids about mental health, the better chance we will have to prevent suicide. If we take the stigma away, we normalize these topics like mental health and suicide early on, they're going to be more comfortable expressing themselves and get the help that they need. You know, we're not born knowing how to speak English or whatever our native tongue is, right? We have to be taught language. And we have to be taught the language of emotions. We also have to be taught the language of coping and helping our children from a very young age learn how to manage emotions. I often try to remind them we cannot punish the emotion out of a child. We can redirect the behavior, but we need to validate their emotions, even if they're small. They're both their emotions and their experiences are their own and they matter and we need to take care of helping them understand that we see them as a human being not as a little kid but that we see them and that we help them with coping with that so let's talk a little bit about local numbers so these are the suicide death numbers from 2015 to 2019 I had hoped I was going to have 2020 numbers this morning but the CDC is behind which is led and the RD heck to be a little bit behind, so I won't know those until October. But if you look here, you can see that in um, 2018, our numbers dropped to 811. And yet, yet in 2019, we had an increase again of 851 South Indians locked to suicide. One death is too many. Part of the reason we look at data and we try all the time to find data you see here is two years behind. It's hard to know what was happening two years ago to know what we need to change. I will tell you, even though I don't have 2020 numbers yet, I'm actually far more concerned with 2021 um, because I think our kids and adults as well are struggling more this year with the prolonged exposure to the implications of the pandemic, um, to racial justice issues, to uh, societal discord, lots of natural disasters, only more because of 851. Of those 851, 120, 123, I'm going to show you in just a second, 109 were males. But before I show you that graph, I wanted you to know sort of these demographic areas of concern, 10 to 14 and 15 to 19. That is an age group that we have seen a consistent uptick in their numbers every year since 2015, more and more of them. So it's important that we have these talks at home, but also also, that, that we embed this, this discussion regarding um, the history of, of, of coping or, or mental health, learning about in music, how do we express ourselves, in science, how, do, how does our brain work with, with emotions, making sure we incorporate this no matter what learning. So let's look at these numbers down by the sex. So you can see that the numbers for females are going down. Um, at least in 2019 they were, but our males continue to go up. And you can see in 2018, we had a pretty big jump from 87 the year prior to 105 males. When I look at data, I look at it and I start to try to problem solve. Okay, what does that mean? Does that mean we reach out to Boy Scouts? Does that mean we go to church youth groups and, and really talk and focus on, on those? the boys, does that mean that um, we really, this is where we see young men and making sure that we're talking to them about how to manage light and fires. Let's look at the youth suicide death numbers by see that that go to 24 back up 
2019 were 18 to 19-year-olds. So every one of our young people are seeing some level of distress. We have begun to ask about tracking younger than 10 years old. Um, so it's because we have, you know, struggling as well. So here's a map of the state that shows you um, the number of suicide death numbers by county. So I don't know if you all are able to see this as clearly as I am, but hopefully you can see wherever your county is to know how, how it rates in comparison to the other counties in our darker ones that have the highest number of deaths certainly are our counties that are more populous than the others. And so that is part of how, why they, they are darker. Um, but nevertheless, more than one death is too many. Before I move on to the next thing, I want to talk about suicide attempts. In 2019, Carolina. So I'll say that again. In 2019, there were 7,081 suicide attempts in, in South Carolina. We record suicide attempts by looking at something called RFA data, which is 7,081 individuals went into a room after an attempt and it was coded on their billing code as a suicide attempt. Attempt. So you you understand then that that doesn't mean that there were only 7,000 attempts that year. It just means those were the ones that went to the hospital and those are the ones that were coded in that way. But think about that number for a second. If those had not made an emergency room, had not called out for help, had not been found, what our numbers would have been. Um, it's staggering to hear that number and to know the level of distress. Even though I don't have 2020 death numbers yet, I did get some preliminary numbers last night regarding ideations and suicide attempts. The ideations went on. And so we saw more folks struggling. Our attempts look like they went down, which gives me hope that more people reached out. And that's what we we want to do in this. So what do we need to know about suicide attempts? 48% of planning during short-term crisis, usually in minutes of a crisis. However, 90% of attempters do not go on turn if it lives or dies. So in Australia, they they did a study of self-inflicted gunshot wounds. 21 of the 33 stated that their attempt was due to an interpersonal conflict with someone. It's likely a family member. Most survivors were young men who did not suffer from major depression or psychosis. And the act was almost always described as impulsive. A similar study was done in Texas with former attempters, and they found 60% conflict. But during the 20 years in South Carolina, by firearms that is higher than the national average. So it is important to make sure that all lethal means are safe in your home at all times. So that if your adolescent or your child finds themselves in a, in a moment of crisis and impulsively acts, they don't have access to the most lethal means um, available to them. And part of the reason I brought up about the interpersonal conflict is one of the things that we see from the young men, the adolescent males, is that it is those relationships, the breaking up of their first love that drives them and is a trigger for a suicide attempt. So let's talk a little bit about what are we going to look for. We had some shared content, so let's talk now about warning signs. So a warning sign in the house if there was a fire, right, would be smoke, or you might smell something in the door. So when you think about this, again, and think about the emotional fire within someone. 
need to buy lot and do, do this in here. I feel every like about me. No no one would maybe they're just like anger. I can be asked. Maybe change me. The big word there is change. If you've seen a change in the way they're, the way they're feeling, the way they're acting, or talking, if this is something that follow, no, to try to head things off early. We want to stop the fire because before it becomes a forest fire. We want to intervene and say to that person, I see you. I see your pain. I want to talk to you about it. So let's look at warning signs for younger children. They may consistently draw dark or violent images. Um, they may vocalize that they want to hurt themselves. You can see there that a study compared um, to suicide um, in 5 to 11, 12 to 14 year olds. I'm sorry. Can you hear me any better? I'm so, so sorry. Sorry. Uh, okay. I see Teresa's comment. Yes, it's pretty bad. Is it any better? Uh, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure. How to make this any busy. All right. I've asked Aaron if there's any ideas for apologies. Um, this underlined portion, if a child says they want to kill themselves, no matter the age, they should be taken seriously every single time. I'll tell you what. Okay. All right. I'm going to talk and walk, so I'm going to get you all to bear with me. Um, while I walk outside and see if this helps us any. Yeah, because right now we can hear you. It is kind of. All right. So as we look at these. All right. I'm going to walk and move outside and see if that helps me. <laughs> All right. So as we think about risk factors, you can see this list here. here. Physical or medical issues, for example, becoming pregnant, being the victim of bullying, being uncertain of sexual orientation, being adopted, all of these things may come with some of the ACEs, um, the adverse childhood experiences that you may see in kids. Hopefully you all can hear me a little bit better. All right, but this is one of my favorite statements. Risk factors are not predictive factors, due to protective factors, meaning even though there may be a lot of things going on that are interfering with kids, that are causing them more distress, maybe they follow under every single ACEs um, category. That does not mean that they have to go on to die by suicide when we have protective factors that come into place. So what are protective factors? Building that foundation for hard conversations is a protective factor. Checking in on them every time you have a concern lets them know that you're somebody they can come and talk to. Other protective factors may be something like access to mental health care. It could be um, their church. It could be their sport that they enjoy, their pet, something that they, they care for, something that wraps around them and protects them letting them know what resources are available. Just like you post 911 on the refrigerator, post the uh, suicide prevention lifeline number on your refrigerator or in your classroom. Post the crisis text line number on your refrigerator or your classroom. We know that the youngest caller to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline out of South Carolina this year was seven years old. Seven years old called the lifeline. 
<clears throat> they had to find the number, find a phone in a day and age where we don't all have home phones anymore and make that very hard phone call. But they did it, thank goodness. We also know that in August and actually every month, the majority of those who were texting the crisis text line out of South Carolina are those who are 14 and younger. About 45% of South Carolina text messages to the crisis text line are 14 years or younger. So please share those numbers with them. South Carolina has its own code for the crisis text line. You simply text the word HOPE, the number four, and then SC. So HOPE for SC to 741-741. Post the lifeline number in your classroom, 1-800-273-8255. Give them the access to what very needed resources. So how do we talk to them? Well, keep calm, remember the, that word, which means collaborate with them. Talk to them about what they're feeling. Ask them what would help make them feel better. Avoid minimizing or blaming things like, what do you have to be upset about? You're so young, you have your whole life ahead of you or breakups happen, I promise you'll love again. That's not what they need in the moment. They just actually need us to listen. The letters that are in the word listen are the same letters that are in the word silent. So when you ask them how they're doing, stop talking and just listen and be there. Maintain your cool. They may say something really scary, particularly if they're your child. If they're saying they wanna die, that can be really, can cause that fire to well up within you because you're so afraid of what may happen to them. Take a breath, take a beat and reach out to them and say, all right, we're gonna get this through, through, through this together as a family. So these are the numbers that I mentioned to you. So. If you have your phone right there, take a screenshot or take a picture of this, this page. Please use these services. I'm gonna point out a couple of extra services. I apologize for the truck, but I came outside for you all, so he's going right by. But the mobile crisis number, we're the only state in the country who has a unified one-stop shop for mobile crisis. So you call that one number 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no matter when, and they will send clinicians out to wherever you are, to your school, to, your, to the Walmart parking lot, to the house, and see what level of care, psychiatric care you need. In many of our counties, we've got 11 counties now where they're doing telehealth with mobile crisis. They can also just try to manage that crisis by phone. So please use that number. The SC HOPES um, number right here is so important and is really underutilized. It's something that started last June in COVID, and it was started to provide financial assistance for treatment for individuals who were having symptoms for the very first time because of COVID or had them worsen because of COVID. So SC HOPES will pay for treatment at either Day Otis or the Department of Mental Health. So if your families are saying, I don't have money to pay for counseling, all they have to do is go in and say, I wanna know more about the SC Hopes help. The other thing I wanna to mention to all of you is that SC Hopes is also doing educator um, support groups virtually right now to take care of you all and to give you a forum to talk about how you're functioning and what your needs are. So I wanna take a minute and I wanna go back and say, I'm really sorry that it was choppy. <laughs> I should have come out here earlier but I hope that you heard enough to have an aha moment. So I'd like you to just take a second and say, what, what did you used to think and what's one new way that you're gonna think about suicide prevention um, after this, this conversation today? So if you'll put that in the chat box or you can unmute. Anybody, are y'all typing? So this doesn't work in the I used to think format. Sorry? It does, this doesn't really work in the I used to think format, but I didn't realize the numbers. Um, I knew, I knew they, it happened, but I didn't realize how high the numbers were. Yeah. 
it is very frightening to think about how high these numbers are. So Cassie says that was a shock. What else? And like I said, please feel free to also unmute because this has to be a conversation that we have as a community. Yes, the age of children attempting suicide, yes, is very shocking. It's a hard time. We really are very concerned about this year and this why we push so hard for the student identification card, um, suicide. Suicide Prevention Act that was passed in May, Senate Bill 231. And many of you are from school districts that have gone ahead and initiated from this law. Um, it adds the crisis text line and the lifeline to the back of every school ID, seventh grade through college. However, as soon as it was signed, they actually went back and said, we've got to redo this by January and we need to go all the way down to kindergarten. And I know many elementary schools don't have school IDs, but how do we get these resource numbers into the hands of kids? I wanted you to make sure that you know you can reach out to the Office of Suicide Prevention. We will send you material you can give to your kids, material you can give out to your parents, to yourselves that you can post around the schools. You don't have to be in this alone. And more importantly, we shouldn't be in it alone. We should have these open conversations together so that we can work together collaboratively to prevent suicide in South Carolina. What else? Don't be shy. And I'm putting my email in the text box so that if you want some of those resource materials, you can just email me. Lindsay said, suicide really happens to young children was surprising to her. Yeah. Oh, I love that, Cassie. I, I'm a safe person. Absolutely. And give out this crisis intervention, yes. And, and Lindsay, to go back to that, I think that's what's so important about um, having these conversations and telling them that you're a safe person. Um, my son is 10. I have two children. One is a 20 year old and one's a 10 year old, long pause in between. Um, and when they were both there with me when the bill was signed by the governor um, in July, and I asked him what he thought about the bill. And he said, I think it's good because kids need to know they can tell somebody if they're upset and that there is somebody that wants to hear them if they're upset. So any, even the young ones know how important it is to feel like someone wants to hear them and someone is there to hear them. Yeah, Whitney said the large percentage, yes. Yeah, it's about 44%. I just got August's numbers right before this presentation. And when we look at the number of folks using the lifeline, there's a huge percentage there that are also um, in that young, young age range. And the crisis text line really is a great service for kids. It, the legislators actually advocated the original bill only had the lifeline. And then the legislator said, no, you've got to give a text option to these kids because they are more likely to be texting than using the telephone. Um, and the crisis text line never shows up on a phone bill. You're never charged for it. Um, it's one that kids could do in a safe space if maybe they can't get to a phone where they don't want to have a safe place to have a conversation but they can quietly text or even for us as, as adults, we can text from our desk during a you know, work time so, or lunch break so that we can reach out. The crisis text line you can use no matter your level of distress. You don't have to wait till you're suicidal. Yeah, Cassie says she was shocked to see the text option. Yes. What other thoughts or questions? What's one thing you're going to do different after we after this presentation? And while you're thinking about that, putting that in there, I'm going to answer Carla's question about do any of the risk factors weigh in more than others? 
not necessarily, although certainly not having a home environment that is a safe place for them to have conversations um, makes it very hard. I used to tell my friends who were in child and adolescent services, you could do the most beautiful therapy or intervention ever and it not be supported and at home. And then it feels like it undid all of that. But remember, it only takes one person, one person to tell somebody else that they matter, that gives them, them a little bit more resiliency to survive a trauma. So you will be that one person. You already are for many of the kids and individuals that you work with. Is the crisis text line number the 741? Yes. Absolutely. That 741741. And it works just like um, as if it was 911 in that they respond immediately. And if you don't text back, they will go, hey, are you okay? I do recommend if you give this number to someone, text them with them, you know, sit there and say, let's do it together or let's call the lifeline together. Um, or if the, a child is worried about someone else or you're worried and you don't know how to intervene, both of those services will also talk you through how to have these conversations with them. So you could write and say, I'm worried about my, my student who's suicidal or my friend or my, you know, my loved one. And they will say, here's some interventions, here's some things you can try and walk you through that and support you through that. Yes, LaShondra, you are absolutely right. Postpartum moms definitely could benefit from this information. We know that they themselves struggle um, with suicidal thoughts and feeling very alone and very isolated. So the more we can share this information, the better. I know I had trouble virtually today, but I promise you, if you ask me to come talk to anyone, we will show up in person or we'll find a better connection next time. But ask us into your communities. I always tell people, and I mean this, I'll come stand in your driveway and talk to you and your neighbors or to your friends about suicide prevention. So we have to, to your church, to your um, fraternity reunion, your family reunion, bring the conversation up, bring it in um, so that we can get this out there and save lives. Jennifer, will you I know, Suzanne, you said we have a hard stop, right? We've got a hard stop. It's just 242. So we've got about eight minutes um, or seven minutes. But I, I know somebody was going to ask a question, but real quick, I didn't know if you wanted to talk real quick about the safe talk um, and your suicide. Yeah, I know you talked a little bit about that, but it was kind of scratchy or in and out. The, the safe, how, tell me more, you're talking about the training or? Yes, yes. Yes. If, if, so, nobody, if, that, if people didn't have questions, I didn't know you, because just the volunteer yeah. part and, you know, if people were interested in um, breaking the stigma. Yes. If you are interested in becoming a suicide prevention trainer, please email me. We are looking for folks all the time, or even if you know someone who would be interested in becoming a trainer. In fact, Right now, we've launched the South Carolina Communities of Care Initiative in the 10 counties in our state that have the highest number of suicide deaths. So those include in the upstate, Anderson, Spartanburg, and Greenville, down the middle part of our state, York, Aiken, Richland, and Lexington, and on the coast, Horry, Charleston, and Berkeley. In those counties, we will be looking for, specifically over the next three months, individuals who would like to become trained for the first ever in the nation trauma-informed zero suicide um, prevention approach and you would become a trainer in how to teach trauma-informed suicide prevention for adolescents and in the um, winter January through March of next year we'll be doing another round of train the trainer opportunities for that in those counties for the trauma-informed suicide prevention for adults so please reach out if you would like to learn more about how to become a trainer in that the trainer is two days, um, and then once you do your train to go provide the training, it would be a day-long training at the most, maybe like four to six hours. But it's a wonderful training, and I think it's really going to help in, in South Carolina make sure that people understand trauma better, that they understand that, um, how to interact with someone who's hurting so we don't increase any suicidal risk. And Whitney, that is to the Department of Mental Health, um, we of South Carolina, 
to do this. We're the first in the country um, to be applying zero suicide to a community setting. That is typically only done in healthcare um, systems. That's what I'm out here doing today at the farmer's market is doing a zero suicide academy for hospital systems. But we know that the majority of those dying by suicide are not at the hospital or at DMH at the time of their death. Where are they? They're in school with you. They're at home with their, with their family, at church, at the, on the sports team, their neighbor, the mailman who knows this is that you haven't mowed the lawn because you're too depressed to get out of bed. So we really are looking for restaurant owners, bankers, hairstylists, dentists, veterinarians, teachers. We're looking for everybody to get trained in how to be trauma-informed um, with regards to suicide prevention. So if you want to be a part of that, please email me and let me know. It's free. We pay for all your training and your materials for the next three years and hopefully beyond that. And then also, as Suzanne mentioned, we do a lot of other train-to-trainer opportunities. Um, so if you're interested in that, please reach out or you want to host a training, we can do that. Okay, does anybody else have, oh, she was asking about your email. Yes, I put it in the chat box, but let me, oh, good, Whitney, that's awesome. All right, I'm going to type it again so that it shows up there at the bottom. So it's just jennifer.butler at scdmh.org. And we would love to have some of you become trainers or like I said, spread the word. Say, even if you say, hey, email me, I want uh, the flyer. I want to share it with some people and see if they maybe are interested. And start, you know, when I went to get my hair cut uh, a month ago, I went in there and I said, hey, anybody interested in becoming a hairstylist? Like, or not a hairstylist, uh, a suicide prevention trainer. And they're like, well, you know, everybody tells us their problems while they're sitting here. And I said, absolutely. That's why I'm asking you. So even if you become an advocate and you say, all right, I'll take the flyer around, see who I could get signed up. That would be great. Yes, Whitney, please email me. Spartanburg is definitely um, one of our 10 counties and we would love to have you. That's great. Does anybody else have any other questions before we wrap up and then let y'all um, go back to the main session for the um, closing speaker? Okay, that's Aaron telling, telling us how to get back. Well, thank Jennifer, you, everybody. And I'm so sorry for the... <laughs> technical difficulties it's, it's the world of zoom the technology the technological issues i really appreciate it jennifer your talk was wonderful um appreciate, appreciate all the participants and we'll see you back at the um main site thank you carla and whitney thank you jennifer <laughs> thank you